supercarriers are among the largest man-made moving objects in the world. Despite having a lifespan of close to 50 years, supercarriers do eventually have to be decommissioned. When that happens, where do these massive ships go to die? Most are broken up for scrap, where some of the parts are repurposed for other ships. One carrier, however, met a very, very different fate. She was destroyed by the very navy that she served. This is the story of the final mission for USS America. Before we delve into the destruction of America, I want to go over the evolution of the aircraft carriers that led to her creation. While many ships throughout history serviced and recovered aircraft, most commonly seaplane tenders, the first dedicated aircraft carrier in history was HMS Argus. Argus was a converted ocean liner commissioned on September 16, 1918, thus making her the only active carrier in the Great War, even though she was too late to see any combat as the war ended on November 11th of that year. Argus featured a long, flat flight deck for launching and recovering Sopwith Sea Strutter biplanes. In these early days of carrier operations, propeller-driven aircraft were able to launch without any catapult assistance. Turning the ship into the wind was sufficient for aircraft to gain enough lift to take off under their own power. Recovering aircraft was less simple. Argus was equipped with a series of wires that would engage a hook on the underside of an aircraft. This system is still in use today, albeit with modernizations. The first American carrier, USS Langley, was commissioned in 1922, just four years after Argus. She was equipped with a gunpowder-fired catapult to aid in launching increasingly heavier aircraft, again another hallmark of carriers still seen today. Of course, now we use steam and electromagnetic catapults instead of gunpowder. World War II saw the greatest use of aircraft carriers in combat. Both the Axis and Allies operated numerous examples, which still relied on the arrangement first pioneered by Argus and Langley, straight decks for both launching and recovering aircraft. The next innovation in carrier design was the angled deck, once again developed by our besties in the UK. You see, recovering aircraft on a straight deck required the pilot to either land correctly the first time or smash into park aircraft on the forward part of the deck. There was no way to go around if the tailhook missed a wire, which often led to disastrous consequences. The angled deck allowed aircraft at the bow to either lay parked or launch, while simultaneously allowing incoming planes to be recovered. If the pilot missed the wires, he could simply power up again and go around unobstructed. HMS Centaur was the first ship to employ this arrangement, which became standard on every subsequent fleet carrier in the U.S. Navy. A carrier employing a catapult in addition to a wired recovery system is called a Catabar Carrier, which stands for Catapult Assisted Takeoff Barrier Arrested Recovery. While there are other types of carriers employing ski jumps and lacking cables, we'll be focusing on the Catabar arrangement moving forward. The term supercarrier is reserved for the largest of aircraft carriers. First coined in 1938 by the New York Times in reference to HMS Ark Royal, there's no concrete definition of the nickname. Since the U.S. Forrestal class, the term has been applied to every American fleet carrier as they have consistently been the largest vessels of the type. In 1960, USS Kitty Hawk was commissioned. She was the first of her class and also bore the nickname Supercarrier. Throughout the 1960s, four of her kind were commissioned. USS Kitty Hawk, USS Constellation, USS America, and USS John F. Kennedy, which was seen as a subclass given several changes to her design. USS America was the third of the Kitty Hawk class. Launched on February 1st, 1964, just over three weeks before Mr. Falcon Sr. was born, she was commissioned in January of the following year. The massive ship displaced 61,174 long tons and had a length of 990 feet. America could accommodate up to 80 aircraft and had a complement of over 5,000 men. The warship was powered by eight boilers driving a four-pack of Westinghouse steam turbines, which could push the Titan to a swift 34 knots. Just for reference, this is like if you put the 70 Pine Building in New York City on its side and drove it at a speed of like 39 miles an hour or 62 kilometers an hour. I'm not even allowed to drive a Jeep through my hometown that fast. I mean, I, I do it sometimes anyway, but you know. America's first cruise took her to the Mediterranean Sea in 1965, where she took part in Fair Game 4, a Franco-American war game to simulate defending against an attack on a NATO ally. 
While she spent most of her time in the Atlantic and the Med, America was sent to Yankee Station off the coast of Vietnam from 1968 to 1972. Over the course of three cruises, she received five battle stars for her actions in the Vietnam War. Notably, it was her A7 Corsairs that destroyed the Tan Hoa Bridge in 1972. Having been dislodged and partially collapsed by laser-guided bombs dropped by the Air Force on May 13th of 1972, U.S. Command ordered a follow-up strike by the Navy. On October 6th, Corsairs from VA-82 Marauders dealt the killing blow to the mighty Vietnamese bridge with walleye-guided bombs. The impact severed the bridge in two and collapsed it completely into the Song Ma River. After Vietnam, America was involved in numerous conflicts in the Med, most notably the 1986 Libyan conflict. You see, the conflict in Libya was sparked by tensions with the dictator of the country, Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi, who funded terrorist activities including the hijacking of TWA Flight 847 in 1985. In March of 86, Qaddafi declared crossing into the Gulf of Sidra to be crossing the line of death. Any ships or aircraft crossing into the Gulf would be considered targets by the Libyan military. Operation Detain Document was kicked off by the U.S. as a show of force given that the majority of the Gulf was considered international waters. USS Coral Sea and USS Saratoga were joined by America that same month, bolstering the force standing against the Libyan aggression. The carriers formed a sort of skirmish line from east to west about 150 miles north of Qaddafi's line of death, ready to stomp out any aggression towards friendly ships passing through the Gulf. Throughout March, the two sides butted heads, but no blood was shed. Tensions came to a head, though, on March 24th, when a trio of U.S. ships led by USS Ticonderoga crossed the line of death. Air cover was launched to protect the warships, including a formation of F-14 Tomcats, EA-6B Prowlers, and A-7 Corsairs. In response, several SA-5 surface-to-air missiles were fired at a pair of F-14s from VF-102, only to be jammed by an EA-6B Prowler's electronic warfare suite. A pair of MiG-25 Foxbacks was sent up after the group, and a pair of VF-33 Tomcats warded them off without firing a shot. Given the hostilities, America launched A-6 intruders as part of a combined strike on the Libyan defenses. The first airstrikes occurred when VA-34 and VA-85 intruders destroyed the Libyan patrol boat Wahid. Meanwhile, A-7 Corsairs conducted a seed flight to kill the SA-5 sites around the city of Sirte. Over the course of the 24th, continued American strikes disabled another pair of patrol boats, and even an Anuchka-class corvette, which was sunk by A-6s in a harpoon strike. The American task force took no casualties that day. Less than a month later, as part of Operation El Dorado Canyon, America launched a dozen A-6s and A-7s as part of a combined Air Force and Navy strike to further cripple the Libyan military. This is in response to the LaBelle nightclub being bombed in West Berlin, which killed three people, including an American serviceman and injured 229. The six intruders and six Corsairs went downtown over Benghazi, striking parked aircraft and air defenses to make way for Air Force F-111 strikes. Again, no Navy personnel were lost, however a lone F-111 was down at the strike, killing Captains Fernando Rivas Dominici and Paul Lawrence. While the cause of the loss is up for debate, it's likely that the Aardvark was downed by a Soviet-built surface-to-air missile. The Swift America was among the last of her kind, as conventional propulsion gave way for nuclear power in the form of USS Enterprise and the Nimitz class. However, she still served well into the 1990s. In 1990, America deployed to the Persian Gulf. This time, she would partake in Operation Desert Shield against the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. On January 17th, Operation Desert Shield became Desert Storm as Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein refused to pull his forces out of Kuwait. President George H.W. Bush ordered a full-scale strike on Iraqi forces, starting the Persian Gulf War. Once again, Carrier Air Wing 1 launched combat sorties to strike ammunition depots, bridges, and mobile scud launchers. The unrelenting strikes lasted for over three weeks until the ground war began. As the ground war began, the scope of the mission changed to support coalition forces pushing into Iraq and Kuwait. 100 hours after the ground war had begun, Kuwait was liberated from the invaders and the war was ended with a ceasefire order. America made several other deployments into the 1990s, however by 1995 she was showing her age and the decision was made to decommission her in 1996 due to budget cuts. On August 9th, she was put in the Ready Reserve Fleet in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania.
Instead of being scrapped as initially planned, the US Navy elected to add America to the roster of SYNCX targets. SYNCX, short for Sinking Exercise, is a program that allows the Navy to test anti-ship weapons like torpedoes, missiles, etc. Until the 2000s, the Navy had sunk plenty of retired destroyers, frigates, and even aircraft carriers. However, they had yet to sink any carrier newer than an Essex-class carrier from World War II. While there were some objections to sinking a ship with the namesake America, the Navy put her on the chopping block to test various weapons. In addition, the SYNCX testing would help naval designers learn ways to improve subsequent carrier designs to better protect the crew. As much as I hate to see a ship named America sunk, the logic was sound. America would be sacrificed to improve safety and damage control on future boats in one final mission. She wouldn't be scrapped, she wouldn't be sold, and she wouldn't become a museum ship. She would go out in a blaze of glory to protect the lives of American sailors in the future. But how does one sink something as large as a supercarrier? Nothing of this scale had ever been intentionally sunk before. Despite being an old boat, the America was still structurally as sound as she was when she launched in the 60s. This really would not be as simple as blasting her with a Mark 48 torpedo like smaller destroyers. So what does it take to sink something as big as a New York skyscraper? Well, I know just the guy to call. My friend at Submariner Touchdown Bane. Hold on, let me, uh, let me dial him up real fast. Making turns for 10 knots, maneuvering out. Bane, it's Falcon. Oh, hey, Falcon. Hey, so I know you're probably super busy right now. Fire the VLS. Um, but I'm doing this little video on SYNCX, and I was wondering what it takes to kill a carrier. Like, can you tell me how America was sunk? No, dumbass, it's classified. Oh, yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. Real talk, folks. Do you think the Navy wants to advertise how to sink one of its modern supercarriers? Of course it's going to be classified. In fact, only one image of the America sinking has been revealed and it really doesn't show us much. I really don't even want to speculate on how one would sink a US Navy carrier because, honestly, it's better that we don't know. That being said, if we have the know-how to sink a US carrier, then something like, I don't know, the Russian Admiral Kuznetsov should be no problem if the ship box doesn't sink itself as it consistently tries to do on an almost yearly basis. America was sunk on May 14, 2005. Now, the Navy was kind enough to give us the location of where she lay on the seafloor, but good luck getting there as she's 16,860 feet down. Fun fact, that's over 4,000 feet deeper than the Titanic. The sacrifice America made has had an impact on the design of Gerald R. Ford carriers coming into service. However, what these improvements are is, again, classified. And that being said, I think I'll call it here. A special thanks goes out to Touchdown Bane, who was kind enough to lend his voice to this video, as well as my Top Gun graduate patrons who volunteered their voices to act as the subcrew. I know I glossed over a few details about America, but I do urge you guys to talk about her further in the comments. She really was an amazing ship. If you want to support myself and Hellion, my beloved artist and partner in crime, check out our Patreons in the description below. It really does help me keep these videos pumping out. Now I know it's hard to say goodbye, but it's only for a little bit because I've got plenty more content planned. One more thing, if you're watching this in the daytime, go look out at that sun as a reminder to keep it at your back. I'll see you around.